Well, we've made it to Esther chapter 9. One more chapter to go after this one. If you remember in our last study, the king allowed Mordecai and Esther to craft a secondary degree, if you will, that would, would protect them from the first decree that, that Haman had devised against the Jews. And chapter 9 tells us the fulfillment of that, that second decree that was made. And I would just like to read it. We'll touch on some, thing as, some things as we make our way through. And then I'd like to share with you what I believe is the main takeaway, at least for me, what the Lord has placed on my heart that I feel I should share with you. Starting in verse 1, we read this. Now in the twelfth month, that is the month of Dar, on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's commandment and his decree drew near to be put in execution in the day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them, though it was turned to the contrary. I love that. That the Jews had rule over them that hated them. The Jews gathered themselves together in their cities throughout all their provinces of the king Ahasuerus to lay hand on such as sought their hurt, and no man could withstand them, for the fear of them fell upon all people. God caused the people to fear them. Verse 3, And all the rulers of the provinces and the lieutenants and the deputies and the officers of the king helped the Jews. So they had the help of the king. All of those that served under the king helped them with this, and here's why. Because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. God caused all those rulers to fear Mordecai. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame went throughout all the provinces. For this man Mordecai waxed greater and greater. We'll talk more about this in our next study, the last chapter. Thus, the Jews smote all their enemies with the stroke of the sword and slaughter and destruction and did what they would unto those that hated them. And in Shushan, the palace, the Jews slew and destroyed 500 men. Then verses 7, 8, 9 list the names, verse 10, of the ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamedatha, the enemy of the Jews, slew they. But, and, and we'll see this but three times, and I, I find it interesting. I'd like to draw your attention to it. It says, but on the spoil they laid not their hand. They destroyed their enemies, but they didn't take their stuff. It wasn't about their stuff. It wasn't about gain. It was about self-defense, self-preservation, which in reality, as we read the study, Self had nothing to do with it. God is in control and delivering his people. But verse 10 nonetheless says, But on the spoil they laid not their hand. On that day the number of those that were slain in Shushan the palace was brought before the king. And the king said unto Esther the queen, The Jews have slain and destroyed five hundred men in Shushan the palace, and the ten sons of Haman. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now, what is thy petition? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request further? And it shall be done. I love this. We've discussed this in a previous study. We won't belabor it again now, but just a quick uh, rehearsal of it. The king is concerned about her request and petition. He's still concerned most of all, what does she desire? And our king this very day is mostly concerned with our heart's desire and our need. Verse 13, then said Esther, if it please the king, let it be granted to the Jews which are in Shushan to do tomorrow according unto this day's decree, and let Haman's ten sons be hanged upon the gallows. 
She said, King, give us another day just to, just to make sure that we eliminate our enemies. Verse 14, and the king commanded it to be done. And the decree was given at Shushan, and they hanged Haman's ten sons. For the Jews that were in Shushan gathered themselves together on the fourteenth day also of the month Adar and slew three hundred men at Shushan. But, there's the second time, on the prey they laid not their hand. But the other Jews that were in the king's provinces gathered themselves together and stood for their lives and had rest from their enemies and slew of their foes seventy and five thousand. And here's the third. But they laid not their hands on the prey. On the thirteenth day of the month Adar, and on the fourteenth day of the same rested day, and made it a day of feasting and gladness. But the Jews that were at Shushan assembled together on the thirteenth day thereof, and on the fourteenth day thereof, and on the fifteenth day thereof, and they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. Therefore the Jews of the villages that dwelt in all the walled towns made the fourteenth day of the month Adar a day of gladness and feasting and a good day, and the sending portions one to another. And Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters unto the Jews that were in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus, both nigh and far, to establish this among them, that they should keep the fourteenth day of the month Adar and the fifteenth day of the same yearly, as the days wherein the Jews rested from their enemies and the month which was turned unto them from sorrow to joy, and mourning into a good day, that they should make them days of feasting and joy, and of sending portions one to another and gifts to the poor. And the Jews undertook to do as they had begun, and as Mordecai had written unto them, because Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had devised against the Jews to destroy them, and had cast pur, that is, the lot. If you remember, it was the casting of the lot that Haman chose to determine what he hoped to be the perfect day of death and destruction for the Jews. So he cast those lots, he left it up to his gods to choose the day, but that's not what took place. As a matter of fact, let me read a passage of Scripture to you. It's Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs 16, verse 33. How fitting a verse this is. Proverbs 16, 33 says this, The lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. The lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. Haman thought he was in control. The enemy thought he had the plan all figured out. He had the upper hand. And he kept casting those lots until it finally fell on what he thought was the perfect day. But it ended up being the day of Purim to God's people. It says, per, that is, verse 24, the lot, to consume them and to destroy them. But when Esther came before the king, he commanded that letters, that his wicked device which he devised against the Jews should turn upon his own head, and that he and his sons should be hanged on the gallows. Wherefore, they called these days Purim, after the name of Pur. Therefore, for all the words of this letter and of all that which they had seen concerning this matter and which had come unto them, the Jews ordained and took upon them and upon their seed and upon all such as joined themselves to them, so as it should not fail that they would keep these two days according to their writing and according to their appointed time every year. It was for the people present 
for their children and for those who would join themselves together as we looked at in chapter 8 verse 17 because of the turning of all of these events people who weren't Jews said hey I want to become a Jew verse 28 and that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, and every city. And that these days of Purim should not fail from among the Jews, nor the memorial of them perish from their seed. Then Esther, the queen, the daughter of Abihel, and Mordecai the Jew, wrote with all authority to confirm this second letter of Purim. And he sent the letters unto all the Jews to the hundred and twenty and seven provinces of the kingdom of Ahasuerus with words of peace and truth to confirm these days of Purim and their times appointed according to Mordecai the Jew and Esther the queen had enjoined them and as they had decreed for themselves and their seed the matters of the fastings and their cry and the decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim, and it was written in the book. What a wonderful turn of events. You know, all throughout the scripture, it, it, we, we see that God establishes days for us to turn our attention to him, if you will. Every week, God says, you're to work six days, but on the seventh day, it was a, a day of rest, a day to remember the Lord and His creation and His provision. There were also established new moons every month. There were certain times of the year for the people of God to, to celebrate. Leviticus 23 tells us that God instituted seven feasts, yearly feasts that would, would cause the children of Israel to remember certain aspects of all that God had done and was doing and promised to do. Passover being one of them for them to remember that God brought them out of Egypt's bondage. And the Lord required that they would do these things every single year. But in this chapter, this is long after the law of Moses was established, long after the required feasts were put into place, Mordecai and Esther realized the miraculous work of God's hand, his providence in their lives and among his people. And they thought it wise, they thought it good that they would establish this yearly remembrance this this yearly feast this festival whereby as we read in in verse 1 though it was turned to the contrary where God turned the tables if you will God used the king and his rulers to help. Even we see God working in the king as we read several times in Proverbs where, where the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord and he turns it wherever he will as a water course. He's still asking Esther in verse 12, what is your petition? What is your request? And then we get to verse 17. And we see that they had rested from their enemies and they made it a day of feasting and gladness. We read again in verse 18, they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. And then in verse 19, we read again, a day of gladness and feasting. And I love this, we, we mentioned this in our last study, a good day. It was a good day. Now, we, we, we can't lose sight of the fact that this day, this day was chosen, if you will, by the enemy to absolutely destroy and annihilate God's people. This day was chosen to do them harm and hurt. But now, this day has become a day of feasting and of gladness and a good day. Now, God is always doing this. Not just in this book. 
He's been doing it throughout this book, and he's been doing it in our lives. He's been doing it in my life continually. As a matter of fact, he promises this in Romans 8, 28. For we know that all things, all things work together for the good of them who love the Lord, who are the called according to his purpose. He's working all things together for good. Yes, even the date, the date of their execution, he worked together for their good. I hope you've learned this spiritual lesson, this idea of, of, of giving thanks and recognizing what God has done in your life. Joseph was another who, who learned this. Because in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, he says to his brothers, You meant this for evil, but God, but God meant it for good. This day is a day of rest, a day of feasting, a day of gladness. It's, it's a, a good day. A good day. You may be this day having what you consider to be a bad day, but if you're a child of God, there will come a day, either in this life or in heaven, where you'll be able to look back on this day that you thought was a bad day, but in reality, it's a good day. Because God works all things together for our good. And I would encourage you to start looking for that good. Start looking for that good. Joseph lived all of the trouble that he went through, but he recognized when he stood on that day, God allowed all this to happen for my good. And that's what the children of Israel are doing right now. And so Mordecai, Mordecai is establishing this, that they would keep it, verse 21, yearly. Yearly they would remember this was a good day. It was the day the enemy chose, but it is a good day. Look at verse 22. It says, as the days wherein the Jews rested. Over and over again, we see that word rested in this chapter three or four times. They rested from their enemies. The word enemy is used four times in this chapter. The enemy was at work, and he's at work right now, but we need not worry about the enemy. We need not focus on the enemy. What he means for evil, what he intends to be bad, God intends for good. Look at the book of Noah, I mean, the book of Job, I'm sorry. And Peter says that, you know, we, we should remember that. Look at, back at Job's life. God is pitiful and merciful, and he works things out in our lives, and that's what he's doing today. It says in verse 22 that they turned unto them from sorrow to joy. From sorrow to joy. The psalmist said in Psalm 30, weeping lasts but for the night. Joy comes in the morning. He gives the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, the oil of joy and gladness for mourning. God turned what was a sorrowful day into a day of joy and from mourning unto, and there it is again, the second time in this chapter, a good day. And then he says again, days of feasting and of joy. They called it Purim because he cast the lot. It seemed like it was out of everyone's hands, but it wasn't out of God's hands. When Haman let go of the lot, or whoever he had rolling it for them, God directed that. He chose that time. He chose that day. And he didn't choose it for the same reason that Haman did. He chose it for their good. Verse 27. <clears throat> it says that the Jews ordained this time that it should not fail, but they should keep it every year. It was a day of rest, to rest in his rule, in his sovereignty, in his control, in his providence that we've talked about. And then in verse 28, and that these days 
should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every providence, every city. We need to remember God's rescues. That's why Jesus instituted communion for us to remember, not interestingly, not our sin, and in this case, not interestingly, what the enemy was going to do, but what, what was the turn of events, what God did. Communion is not for us to remember our sin, but to remember the Savior. It's a good day, and we're to remember those things. We're to celebrate his come-throughs, if you will. And time and time again, he has come through for me. When my back was against the wall, when I had nowhere to turn, when it seemed that all hope was lost, God worked it to be a good day. I, I want to read a passage of Scripture, or remind you of a passage of Scripture, but I, actually, I, I just want to read the entire psalm. In Psalm 103, verse 2, the psalmist says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Don't forget, the psalmist says. This was done as a day of remembrance. Look at what David says in Psalm 103. I just want to read the whole psalm. It's so fitting for this moment. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that love him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as the flower of the field he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and those that <clears throat> remember his commandments to do them. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heaven, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Bless the Lord, ye his angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all ye his hosts, ye ministers of his, that do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. I just want to read verse 2 again. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. They established this day, verse 28, as to be a day of remembrance. To remember that God defeated their enemies and he delivered his people. And then it says, and that these days of Purim should not fail from among the Jews, nor the memorial of them perish from their seed. A memorial of his miracles. To memorialize that day, to glory in his grace. And that's what we should be doing, memorializing those days where God comes through. Where he works about his miracles in our hearts and in our lives. There's so many examples of this type of thing in my life, and I'm sure you could share with me, and it would probably do us good to spend time gathering together and doing what Mordecai is suggesting, to remember, to set aside times to say, hey, I remember when God did this, and I remember when God did that. Oftentimes in the Old Testament, they would pile up stones and say, hey, when your children ask, what meaneth these stones? This is what we should be doing. I could share multitude of miracles in my life. I just share one. It come to my mind. I don't know why this one does, but maybe it'll minister to someone who's listening. I got a job years ago in, in insurance, 
I was making more money at this job than I had ever made before in my life. And my peers in the office were making even more money than me, many of them, and, and many of them were buying new homes, they were buying cars, they were buying boats. And the temptation was great for Cindy and I to, to do the same. You had all this extra money and we could just, we could do things that we never could do before, but we both felt the Lord was leading us to pay off our debts and to save as much money as we could. It was contrary to what we thought in and of ourselves. But by God's grace, we, we yielded to that leading and we did just that. We paid off our debts. We began to save money. And then a day was determined by the corporate headquarters of this company. No one in the office knew anything about it. But the day was set, a special meeting was given, and we all sat there in the office, and we got the news. We had been told that it was about our contract, so we thought, hey, we're going to be getting some type of adjustment in our pay and our commissions. But the district manager sat there and, with this somber, sad look on his face and declared that the company was closing up this region. They were packing up shop, and they were just not going to do business here anymore. And I said in that circle of men, men crying, with stress on their face, wondering, these people who had bought cars and boats and houses went in further debt because they were depending on the income that they had. And I, I sat there. I wasn't weeping and crying. God had prepared me for this date. This date that was out of my control. This date that I knew nothing about. But in His grace and in His mercy and in His providence, He beat me to that date. And He placed upon our heart, Cindy and I, what we ought to be doing during this time. So when the day came, it wasn't a day of defeat for us, like many of the peers sitting in the room with me. It wasn't a day of sadness. It was a day of rejoicing. It was a day of gladness because not only did they let us all go, they gave us a severance package and because we had paid off our debts and we had saved some money, we were able to live off of that severance pay until God provided another job for me. I'll never and should never forget that. I've shared it a multitude of times because God gets the glory for that. I had no idea what was going on. As I said to you, I wanted to do what everybody else was doing with this extra money. It wasn't my idea to save it. It wasn't my idea to pay off our debts. But God knew. And His providence in my life was great. And I see His hand in my life as I see in this chapter, in this book. And it so encourages me. It so blesses my soul. How many times God has turned my horror into a holiday. And that's what he's done for the Jews in this book. He turned their horror into a holiday. Pur, the casting of the lot, became Purim, a feast that is celebrated to this very day among the Jews. They read this book on each year celebrating God's Defeat of his enemy and deliverance of his people. So I just want to encourage you to, to just spend some time thinking about when God turned your horror into a holiday. When God beat you to a certain date on the calendar that was intended for your harm, for your hurt, for your horror, but God made it a holiday. Maybe in your case, and as in mine, sometimes not only, not always on that specific date, but it, it, at some point, 
He turns it into a holiday, a day of feasting and joy, a day of gladness, a good day. And I can look back over my past, and I hope tonight you can too. Every day that I've ever lived, from the day that I was born to this moment that I'm able to share with you the truth of God's Word, every day has been a good day. Every single day has been a good day. And tonight I have the hope, the faith, the, the assurance that every day that follows this one will be a good day. So what are we to do in light of all this? Number one, I encourage you, rest in his rule. He is still in control. He is still sovereignly God of heaven and earth. Rest in his rule. Number two, remember his benefits. As David says, forget not all his benefits. Rehearse them as he does in Psalm 103. Just go down the list. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your blessings. See what God hath done. And number three, rejoice in his wonderful works. Rest in his rule. Remember all of his benefits and rejoice in his wonderful works. God bless you until we get together next week, Lord willing, and wrap up the last chapter, three whole verses.